So I want to talk about some recent work, which, which uh, is, is joint with a, a bunch of great people at Penn, my colleague Osbert Bastani and uh, graduate students Varun Gupta, Chris Jung, George Narav, and Ramya uh, Ramalingam. And to sort of set the stage, I want to notice that, OK, we use machine learning for all sorts of things. We've got a bunch of very good methods for making um, point predictions. Right, so um, the kinds of things we use machine learning for are, you know, pretty consequential now. It's used sort of um, as a matter of course in, in lending decisions. It's used in personalized medicine. Um, you know, it's used in many parts of the criminal justice system. But the things that we're really good at doing are, uh, you know, making predictions. You know, this. Um, you know, piece of skin is likely to be cancerous. This credit applicant is likely to pay back their loans. Um, and even when we are good at making predictions in the aggregate, you know, our predictions aren't perfect. And the question that we should really ask if we're making consequential decisions about people, especially, is which of the predictions that we make should we, should we feel particularly confident in? And which of them should we perhaps have less confidence in? Which is to say we need some way of quantifying uncertainty. And one natural way to do that is rather than making just point predictions to give prediction sets. So for example, um, if I have an image and I'm trying to predict like what is the animal in the image, um, well, maybe if I'm really confident, I, maybe I'll just, I'll just go for it. I'll say, you know, this is a fox squirrel. But maybe if I've got some less confidence than, than that, you know, I should, I should give a, a list of labels that I think might correctly uh, label this image. You know, maybe it's, it could be a fox squirrel, but maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a marmot. Uh, it could be a mink. It could be a weasel. Who knows? Right? And similarly, if I'm solving a, like a regression problem, like you know, say in a, in a personalized medicine application, I'm trying to predict someone's blood oxygen concentration in 24 hours, maybe rather than giving like this a point prediction, like a number, I should give an interval. And the, the goal of a prediction set is to give a set of labels that is guaranteed to contain the true label with some, some guaranteed probability, like say 95%. Okay, and the idea is if I, can, if I can give a set of labels that comes with a mathematical promise that it contains the true label with some probability, say 95%, then the size of the prediction set gives you some idea of my certainty. Right, like if, in particular, like maybe if I want to make a decision, then I can be confident making the decision if all of the labels in the prediction set are consistent with the decision that I want to make. And if they're not, then maybe I should be a little careful. Maybe I should, maybe I should give the decision to some uh, you know, like human decision maker, for example. OK. So let me tell you about um, a simple technique called conformal prediction that I'm going to spend much of the talk beating up on, but but actually it's it's pretty cool. So like you know if you haven't heard of it before, like you know uh, this is a very simple, practical, useful thing. Uh, I'm going to then beat up on it, but but let me tell you what it is first. Um, and it's it's a very simple method that can sort of take an arbitrary uh, you know um, black box that makes predictions, and without knowing anything about it, can affix. Those predictions with uh, with prediction intervals that are that are guaranteed in a certain sense that I'm going to talk about to cover the labels with 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 whatever the desired probability is. So here's how it works. So first you pick your arbitrary black box model. Okay, like, like it, it doesn't have to be a regression model. It could be a classification model, but maybe just as a running example because it's the simplest case. Suppose I'm solving some regression problem, like I'm going to try to predict blood oxygen concentration in patients 24 hours from now. So I'll, I'll pick some regression model, maps, maps patient features to numbers, doesn't matter what it is. And then I'm going to pick something called a, a conformity score, which is just a you know, fancy way of saying you know, it's going to give me a way to measure given you know, an example like, uh, like a patient record X and a candidate label Y hat, 
um, how similar is this label to my prediction? So maybe like the simplest choice if I'm if I'm uh, solving a regression problem is just to say, well, the, the sort of similarity of a, a label to my prediction is just the, the difference between them. How far is the label from my prediction? Okay, call that my conformity score. And then I'll take a holdout set, and on this holdout set, I'm just gonna find the smallest threshold such that if I'm aiming for 95% coverage, you know, on the holdout set, 95% of the examples truly do have label that has conformity score less than the threshold. And then, you know, I'm going to take that threshold and I'm going to run with it. And if I see a new example, a new patient, for example, what I'm going to do is I'm always going to look at the, um, you know, I'm always going to look at my model. I'm going to look at what it predicts. I'm going to look at the conformity score. And the prediction set I'm going to output is the set of all labels that have conformity score less than this threshold. So in our simple running example, that just corresponds to, you know, well, what have we done? We've found some threshold tau that on our holdout set, on our like historical data, um, when I take a prediction interval of width tau, it covers the true label 95% of the time. And on a new example, I'm just going to, uh, centered at my point prediction, predict a, you know, an interval of width tau. OK, this works. And the promise is that uh, prediction intervals uh, produced in this way, more generally prediction sets produced in this way, at least if all of the data was sampled IID, have the property that they really do cover a new label 95% of the time. Okay? And, it, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what this, what this probability um, statement, you know, what is the randomness this probability statement is over. This is what's called a marginal guarantee. And the probability statement is, is really over everything. It's over, the, it's, the, it's over the label, but it's also over the randomness of X, the randomness of the patient who walked into my office. And it's also over the randomness of the points I had in my holdout set. Okay. So... You know, I said I was going to beat up on unconformal prediction, which, you know, by the way, awesome technique. Like, you know, don't, don't, get the, don't get the wrong impression. But, like, what's wrong with marginal guarantees? Okay, maybe to, like, make, maybe to make it a little bit more concrete, you know, let's run with this uh, uh, maybe personalized medicine example. So maybe we're in the early stages of a pandemic. We're trying to marshal scarce medical resources. Um, patient comes into my hospital and I'm trying to predict, you know, what their, what their uh, blood oxygen level is going to be in 24 hours time to figure out what kind, of, what kind of care they need now. And so maybe I've got some model for doing that. Given, you know, given your features X, which I can read off of your medical chart, um, our model predicts that your blood oxygen level in 24 hours time will be something. It'll be F of X. Okay. Now, um, if I'm going to make a decision based on this, right, if I'm going to decide whether you need to be admitted to the hospital, for example, the patient uh, or the doctor might, you know, anyone who cares about the decision might reasonably ask, you know, okay, well, how sure are you of this? Is this like a good prediction for this patient or not? And, you know, having seen the talk up till now, right, the, the doctor, but not further, the doctor might say, well, okay, you know, um, I've got a 95% prediction interval that your blood oxygen level will be within some bounds, between some lower bound and some upper bound. And, and so what I want to think about is, you know, okay, well, what, what does this mean? Right? What does this mean for the patient for whom we might be making a decision about whether to admit them to the hospital or not? And ideally, what the patient might hope this means, what her doctor might hope this means, is that this is what's called a conditional guarantee, meaning that like the statement we're making is really about the patient, or at least conditional on everything we've measured about the patient. Meaning like it should be that the probability that this patient's label, this patient's blood oxygen level is between our predicted bounds, conditional on everything we know about them, conditional on you know, everything in their medical chart X, that really should be 95%. And okay, like what's the randomness over in this statement? Well, okay, it's a little hard to say, but you know, maybe it's somehow over the, you know, the unrealized randomness of the world, or at least the unmeasured randomness of the world. But if you think about this for a little bit, you, you realize, you know, this kind of statement's impossible to make. You, you, you can't make statements. In, you know, machine learning is a statistical methodology. You can't make statistical statements about individuals. And so 
what conformal prediction promises and what essentially all similar techniques promise are what are called marginal guarantees, right? Like the, the syntax is very similar. It says, um, you know, there's a 95% chance that this patient's label falls within the lower and upper bounds, but the semantics are quite different because the randomness here is not just over Y, the label, but also over X, the patient. This is an average over patients, an average over people. Okay. Now, okay, well, what's wrong with an average over people? Well, let's go back to our example of the patient and the doctor. Well, okay, our, where were we? Our, our doctor has just announced to our patient that, that she's got a 95% marginal prediction interval about where her blood oxygen is going to be in... in uh, 24 hours time. And our patient might think to herself, well, hmm, you know, I'm part of some demographic group that uh, is perhaps medically relevant, right, and represents less than 5% of the population. In which case it could be you know, entirely consistent with the guarantee of a marginal prediction interval is that this method is, is always wrong for not just her, but for people like her, people within this medically relevant demographic group, right? Like consistent with the promise that our machine learning technology produces intervals that cover the label for 95% of patients. Um, you know, consistent with that is that it never covers the label for some small demographic group that's medically relevant. Right, it gets sort of, you know, in averaging over everybody, it's sort of papering over what might be sort of disparate performance on, on different parts of the population. Now, if the groups are disjoint, if our, if our groups are just, you know, uh, disjoint segments of the population defined by, you know, like binary sex or, or various uh, uh, racial breakdowns, you know, maybe that's not such a big problem. Maybe I can just, you know, like separately, separately run a conformal prediction method or something else on each of these different groups. But, um, you know, if the groups are not disjoint as they very naturally might not be, we run into a problem, right? So suppose our patient asks, so, you know, having seen again the talk up through this point, asks, well, okay, you know, that's a, you, know, you gave me a marginal prediction interval. It's an average over people. What about for people like me? And, and what's the doctor going to say? Well, she might say, well, for, for African Americans under the age of 50, uh, the 95% prediction intervals from A to B. And for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction intervals from C to D. And for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction intervals from E to F. And of course, our patient, these are not disjoint groups, right? Our patient might be a member simultaneously of all of these groups. And again, consistent with the promise of a 95% marginal prediction interval is that these, you know, like A to B, for example, could be entirely disjoint from E to F, right? Like our patients, what's our patient to make of, uh, you know, all of these sort of disparate predictions, which might be entirely disjoint from one another? Right, so, so, so what does this mean for, for our patients? Okay, so, so that was you know, my first um, attempt at, at you know, beating up on these marginal guarantees. Another complaint to make about uh, conformal prediction-like methods is that they require statistical assumptions, typically something like exchangeability, which is satisfied if the data is drawn IID, but morally this just means that the future should look like the past, which, which sort of makes sense, right? It's a very convenient assumption to make, and it means that you can calibrate on this holdout set and like expect that your performance will be similar on new data. But like, you know, like oftentimes the prediction tasks we want to solve do not correspond to exchangeable data, right? So for example, we might have time series data, which is, you know, the punchline of this cartoon, right? Do your, um, the, the history of Christmas gifts that you might like um, is, is time dependent. It's not, if I, if I randomly permute it, you know, it's going to look very different. And similarly, you know, if I'm, if I'm making predictions about like blood oxygen level as a pandemic progresses, the data, you know, the future data doesn't necessarily look like the past data. The pandemic progresses through different populations, right? Maybe initially we're seeing sort of young affluent travelers from Europe, then we're seeing essential workers, right? So the label, the feature distribution changes. As treatments get better, the label distribution changes, right? Like it's, it's convenient to assume that the future will look just like the past, but it's often not true. And so, what we'd like to do is to sort of 
mitigate both of these problems. We'd like to come up with a way to give prediction sets in some general way that, that give guarantees that are stronger than just these marginal guarantees and also can do so without assuming anything about the data. Right? If we don't assume anything about the data, then we don't have to worry that our assumptions are wrong. Okay. By the way, let, like, let me encourage people to just like raise their hands and ask questions if they want, if anything I'm saying is, is unclear. It doesn't have to be a, a lecture. I'm happy if it's more like a conversation. Yeah. So in the time frame of the data, could you use your seat mic, please? In time series data, you're relying on the integrity of the data scientist or the person assigned to record the data. And I can personally attest to the fact in New York City, a huge, well, it's a clinical center. They are receive HHS funding. The Smith graduate recording the data had a yoga class to go to. She changed the date because she said she wouldn't have time to do that. I've witnessed that in another office setting. In that case, it wasn't someone who had an appropriate research background. So I wonder, unless you're using electronic records which are stamping the data, you're running into these issues with the integrity of the data. For sure. You know, like in any, any kind of application, you have to worry about data integrity, even if it's not time series data. Um, that's not something I'm going to speak to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about what you do with the data if you're able to get it in some okay. high quality form. But of course, these are very real and important issues. And the center was headed by a Columbia Cornell MD, by the way. Oh, good school. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah, go, go. I'm a Columbia graduate. Um, okay, so, so how can we how can we um, make predictions that are that, that offer stronger than marginal guarantees? Let, let's think about some some um, ways people have done that in the past. So one is called calibration, right? It's sort of motivated by weather forecasting. Right, so every day you turn on like the TV, the weather forecaster says things like there's a 30% chance of rain today. There's a 60% chance of rain today. So the, qu the question is like, what does that mean? Like, like you know, each day only happens once. It's not a repeatable event, right? So, so how do you, how, how do you like, how can you tell if someone's a good weather forecaster or not, right? If they say there's a 10% chance of rain and then it rains, that doesn't mean they're wrong. And so you could approach this by thinking about like a hypothesis testing problem. Like suppose, you know, our, um, yeah, suppose our hypothesis is that the weather forecaster is an oracle. Here's the oracle of Delphi, right? So, so in this model, like, you know, every morning, like, God tells the weather forecaster the probability of rain. It's going to rain, you know, with probability P today. He, you know, he tells the world. And then, in fact, you know, God flips the coin, and with probability P, it rains. Or maybe we can think about, like, hypothesis tests that will at least try to falsify the hypothesis that, you know, our weather forecaster is an oracle. And so we can think about how to do that. One like very simple one might be that you know, we should ask that you know, the average over time, the frequency with which he says it should rain should you know, equal up to error terms, or at least in the long run, the actual frequency with which it rains. But if you think about it, it's too easy to pass that test. You know, if I just always predict that the thing that's going to happen today is the thing that happened yesterday, I'll pass that test. Right? If, it, if it rained yesterday, I'll say 100% chance of rain today. If it didn't rain yesterday, I'll say 0% chance of rain, to rain today. And on average, I'm, I'm right. You know, I'm just like one day off. But like obviously, it's, you know, like this, these aren't very good weather forecasts. And so calibration strengthens that test in an in a interesting way. It says, OK, um, the weather predictions should be right even conditional on the prediction. Meaning, if I look at all of the days on which the weather forecaster said there was a 20% chance of rain, on that subset of days, it should have rained 20% of the time. If I look at all of the days on which the weather forecaster said it was a 70% chance of rain, then in the long run, on that subset of days, it should have rained 70% of the time. OK, so it's, it's, slightly, it's a slightly, slightly stronger guarantee, at least, that can't be you know, falsified by just predicting what happened yesterday. Because right? if I predicted 100% chance of rain whenever it rained yesterday, you'd quickly figure out, well, you know, on the days when I predicted 100% chance of rain, it doesn't rain nearly 100% of the time. OK, so that's one strengthening. We'll want to do that. We'll want to do something else as well. And the, the idea, um, the thing we're going to ask for I'm going to call prediction set multi-validity. Um, 
And uh, okay, there's, there's like some math here, but it's a simple idea. So, so maybe don't try to read the slide. I'll just tell you what it says. So we're going to think about some sequential prediction problem. Again, people walk into the hospital, say we, we make predictions. Eventually, we find out what their true label is. I'm going to say that a, a sequence of 95% prediction sets is threshold calibrated and multi-valid on a sequence of examples. And multi-validity will be parameterized by a collection of groups. If, if you want, to, you can think about these groups as being sort of the medically relevant demographic groups from our example. OK, so people with a family history of diabetes and ag allergies, African-American women over the age of 50, or any, anything you like, right? They're, it's parameterized by some collection of groups that each person is or is not a member of, and, and these can intersect. So they can be a member of, of many of the groups. And what we're going to ask for is that our prediction sets cover 95% of the labels, not just overall but also in a calibrated way, conditional on the sort of threshold we chose on the conformal score, and also conditional on membership in the group. Right? So, so we should cover 95% of the labels even when we zoom in on people with egg allergies and a history of, um, you know, family history of diabetes, even when we zoom in on African American women over the age of 50. Right, so, so for example, you know, if, if the groups correspond to you know, these shapes, I want to have prediction intervals that cover 95% of the labels overall, but also for triangles and circles and squares and stars, also for blue examples and green examples and orange examples, also for examples that are glowing and examples that are not glowing. Right, these, these groups are intersecting. And I want it to be that I can zoom in on any one of them, and still my promise that we cover 95% of the labels is, is correct. OK, so, so just you know, like going back to our, our patient here, right? Like the doctor was going to give this prediction interval to the patient. The patient can, at her option, interpret this as an average guarantee over everyone, or over African Americans under the age of 50, or women with a family history of diabetes, or people with egg allergies and no history of smoking. And her interpretation is correct, is simultaneously correct for all of these. Because the promise we make is that the statistical meaning of these prediction intervals, that they cover 95% of, of the labels, is true not just overall, but simultaneously for all of these demographic groups. ad hoc after the model's been generated? Uh, the groups do need to be defined ahead of time. But as you'll see, I'm going to allow there to be like really, truly a lot of them. So like in a medical application, you might you know, guess what are like medically relevant things. But you don't need to have a good guess. If you have even like a mild like inkling, you know, throw that group in there. Because the cost for having lots of these groups will be very mild. So this is, this is what I want to achieve. Let me just point out that there's all sorts of these conformity scores. I, I talked about this sort of simple one for regression, but there's like a whole cottage industry where people come up with new clever conformity scores. So for example, if you didn't like the fact that in the simple conformity score for regression that I showed you earlier, every single example has the same width prediction interval. And so it's not really disambiguating between examples that I'm confident on and examples that I'm not confident on. Well, you know, there's methods based on conformal prediction that allow you to give intervals of different width for, for different examples that really let you distinguish between examples that you're confident on and those that you're not. You know, if you say, well, you know, I'm not even solving a regression problem. I'm, you know, I want to. Uh, I'm designing a, a self-driving car, and I need to classify things as children and bicycles and stop signs. That's fine too. You know, there's there's uh, conformity scores that that take as input the you know the softmax outputs of of your favorite neural network and produce uh, discrete prediction sets. Right, like this picture could be a chihuahua or a blueberry muffin. Uh, we're not sure, but it's 95% you know, chance that it's one of the two. OK, so there's lots of these. And we would like to be able to like, ingest the fruits of this cottage industry. OK, so conformal prediction is this general wrapper. It takes a general you know, arbitrary black box model. It takes a conformity score. And then it gives you a way to satisfy this marginal guarantee. We'd like to be in the same position. We want to take as inputs an arbitrary 
uh, model, an arbitrary conformity score, and just offer like a stronger guarantee. Okay. So like, there's some structure here. Fixing the conformity score, conformal prediction sets are these one-dimensional objects. Remember, the prediction set that I'm going to give on a new example is just the set of all labels such that the conformity score on that label is less than some threshold tau. So the, you know, once you tell me the conformity score, the prediction set just depends on this one-dimensional thing, tau. The prediction set gets smaller as tau becomes smaller and becomes bigger as tau becomes larger. And so to solve this general problem, we can really think about just coming up with prediction intervals Right, between you know, zero and, and some tau that cover the conformity score 95% of the time. We can sort of abstract away the details of the label and the relationship between the label and the conformity score and just think about the conformity score and whether our, whether our um, threshold tau cho chosen each day covers the conformity score. Right, because there's this like one-to-one -one correspondence. If I choose a threshold that covers the conformity score, that means my prediction set covers the label. And if I choose a threshold that doesn't cover the conformity score, that means my prediction set doesn't cover the label. So to solve this problem in generality, it suffices to come up with some way to pick these thresholds so that I cover the conformity score 95% of the time, and I don't have to worry about the details of what that conformity score is, which is going to allow me to you know, ingest this, this whole you know, little industry of coming up with clever conformity scores. Okay. So let me define now the problem we want to solve. Okay, it's a... It's a what would be called an adversarial online prediction problem. And if you're not deeply enmeshed in computer science, you, you might sort of wonder, what do you mean an adversary? Like in, in prediction problems that we really want to solve, like, you know, okay, maybe the data is not drawn IID, but like there's usually not, not really an adversary who's trying to mess up the guarantees of our algorithm. Um, and we know that. But the merit of trying to analyze an algorithm under the presumption that the, you know, the data is coming from, a, from an adversary, an adversarial process that is trying to you know, maximally ruin the promises that your algorithm might give, right, allows you to prove bounds that don't make any assumptions. And if you haven't made any assumptions, then you don't have to worry on your realistic task that, of course, doesn't involve an adversary. Uh, you, haven't, you don't have to worry that the task has violated your assumptions. Okay, so if you can, you know, it's, a, it's a difficult model to work in, but if you can get nice results in an adversarial model, you get extremely robust solutions that do not rely on, on statistical assumptions that might not be true. So what's the model? Well, time proceeds in rounds, which I'll index by little t here. And in rounds, What's going to happen? The adversary is going to select a vector of features. Like the adversary is going to decide which patient is going to walk into the hospital. The adversary is going to decide on a label for that patient, but it's not going to show the algorithm the label. It's only going to show the algorithm the features. Then the learner has to choose this threshold. And only after that choice is made, oh, and, and the threshold corresponds to a prediction set, because we have a conformity score. So you know, once we've chosen the threshold, that corresponds to outputting the prediction set of all of the labels whose conformity score is less than that threshold. So only then, after the learner has committed to this threshold, this prediction set, does the adversary reveal what the label is, and therefore what the conformity score was. And then we show the conformity score to the learner, and so the learner gets the feedback of whether they covered the, you know, covered the conformity score or not, whether they covered the label or not, and they can use that in, in deciding how to make their predictions at the next round. And our goal here is for the prediction player for any set of demographic groups, say, that we might specify, to be able to promise that at the end of the day, no matter what the adversary did, uh, we, should, we should empirically guarantee 95% calibrated multi-valid coverage. That's the, that's the premise. That's the thing we're trying to do. Okay. So before I tell you a little bit about how you do it, are there any questions at this point now that I've laid out the problem we're trying to solve about what we're trying to do? Okay. Oh, is that a... Question in the back. I 
I don't know. How about this one? Okay. Oh. Uh, so the, the adversary selects some features and shows that to the learner, but the learner doesn't know what the label is for those features. So this is... Uh, yeah, like, well, well like the goal of the learner is to produce a prediction set that you know, 95% of the time covers the label. This would be very easy to do if the learner already knew the label, right? So I'm trying to predict like your blood oxygen level, you, you know, tomorrow. Um, I could be very confident about that if I already knew the answer. The, the, the point is I have to make the prediction without knowing the answer and then, but like nevertheless, I'd like the size of my prediction set to be, you know, an accurate quantification of my uncertainty and the way we're realizing that is by requiring that these prediction sets cover the label 95% of the time. Collecting the test data for the uh, for the or the validation set for the learner, like we there, can, we don't know what the learner had before. Yeah, there's there's no like you know test data or validation set. It's just you know every day you know a new patient walks into your office. They have features you can look up you know in their medical chart and you know all sorts of things about them, and then you have to make a prediction, and then you learn the outcome. Okay, and you're we're going to evaluate your performance cumulatively as you go. There's, you know, there's no distribution here. There's no like test set. Yeah. No, I choose a different threshold every day for each person. So, so it's a, each person gets their own prediction set. What is the loss here? What do you mean the loss? Is there a penalty on the so our, yeah, so I'll, I'll say, you know, what I mean by, you know, like approximate multivalid coverage, but essentially the way I will evaluate success is if at the end of time when I zoom in on any group, when I zoom in on the subset of that group for which I made predictions corresponding to a particular threshold, this is the calibration thing, you know, I will, I will declare success if for all of those subsets my prediction set covered the label 95% of the time. I don't want it to cover it too little, and I also don't want it to cover it too much. Ideally, my prediction sets are small, right, and, and cover the label 95% of the time. If my prediction method is good, that's what will happen. But this is, some, this is a wrapper that can go on top of any prediction method, and so if my prediction method is bad, the only way to achieve this will be to have big prediction sets, and that's, that's how we're quantifying the uncertainty. That makes sense. Good. Yeah. Where are the groups coming from? Yeah. So the the, the question is, wh where do the groups come from? Um, so, so first of all, what are the groups for? Well, they they define what we're asking for. The you know, this guarantee of multivalid coverage means we should get correct coverage even when we zoom in on each of the groups, and they can be arbitrary. So you would pick them based on you know, your concerns or domain knowledge, right? In a, a medical application, you might pick things that, you, pick properties of a patient that you think might be medically relevant. Otherwise, you might pick demographic groups based on, you know, gender or... or uh, oh, well, there are no groups on this slide, but each individual X will be a member of some of the groups. The groups are just subsets of the feature domain. And... Multi-valid coverage, the thing we're aiming for, is defined in terms of the groups. So the adversary picks the groups. Well, the adversary picks the features, which determines what groups they're a member of. Right, like, okay. right, like a group might be you know, people with egg allergies over the age of 35. Right, right, so you know, once I have your medical history in front of me, and that's what the adversary picks, I know, are you in the group or not? OK. Yep. So the, the adversary, I'm assuming that was, uh, uh, well, uh, this is the question. Is the adversary constrained at all in their choice? So the groups have been specified. The, the adversary is going to pick the features of an individual that determines what group they're in. But, you know, could the adversary show me the same patient every time? Could, yeah. The adversary is not constrained at all. So it's a challenging model. But if we can show something in this model, then it'll work for whatever your situation is. So, uh, like I said, the adversary is still... Subject to the same X every day. No, the adversary chooses a different X every day. No, a different the, not the X of T. The 
the large X, like that. Oh, oh yes, I mean, like, like the adversary. The, the you population know. can't change. He can't do the same thing for like twenty days and then. The next think time. about the think about X is not think about X as sort of like capital X as sort of like the schema for the data, right? So, so it's like the the things that can appear in your medical chart, and, and that's fixed and known to the learner. And you you know the groups are a subset of capital X. Maybe one more question, then I'll move on. <laughs> if you also tell me your question, I can oh, okay. repeat it. Um, yeah, can you provide some intuition for why we don't need to do this like in a regret-based way? Like why we could hope to get sort of exact 95% calibration instead of like against some optimal in hindsight or whatever? Um, yeah, so the question is why do we need to, why can we hope to get this like exactly instead of some kind of regret bound? So, so okay, so, so yeah, when we get to the results, we'll see, of course, we can't get this exactly. We'll get this up to some error term that will sort of look familiar to error terms that show up in regret bounds. Um, but like we don't need to, comp you know, but we will be able to converge okay. to this quickly and I think you'll see why. Okay, okay. all good questions. Okay, so, so, so what do we, let, let's get into some more technical details. You know, what, what do we want to do? Well, let's write down some notation. So for each group S, S here is just some subset of the, um, of the feature space. And for each threshold tau, what we'd like is when we zoom in on people from group S for whom we predicted threshold tau, that we actually cover 95% of the labels empirically on that subsequence. 95% is just my stand-in for any confidence parameter you'd like. Okay, so, so let's, for a particular group S and threshold tau, like write down a quantity that's measuring like how well you're doing. So V S tau at time t is just, you know, when I, when I zoom in on the subsequence of days for which the person who showed up was in group S and the threshold I predicted was tau, it's just asking what is the difference between the empirical coverage that I have on that subsequence, the fraction of days for which I actually covered their label, which remember happens whenever the threshold is above the conformity score, uh, compared to my target. You know, I wanted to cover 95% of the labels on this subsequence. I actually covered some other fraction. Uh, the absolute difference between these on the subsequence, that's, that's the thing that I want to be small for every subsequence. Here, you know, this, this n term, this is just the length of the subsequence. So, you know, I, when I'm dividing by this n term here, uh, I'm really turning, you know, the, the number of days on which I covered the label into the fraction of days on which I covered the label. Again, restricted to the subsequence defined by a demographic group and a threshold. And let, let's think about, like, how well we should hope to do here. Well, you know, even if, I, even if there was no adversary, Right, even if the conformity score was drawn from like a distribution, right, the labels were drawn from a distribution that I knew, and so I, you know, really there's like a, a threshold that would cover the conformity score 95% of the time. Okay, if I knew that and used that threshold, still my empirical coverage would not be exactly 95%, right? It's like, you know, if I flip 100 coins, the number of heads isn't exactly 50. Even in that case, my empirical coverage would differ from my target by an amount that was sort of on the order of one over the square root of the length of the sequence. Okay, like even in the ideal case, my empirical coverage, I would expect it to deviate from my target by something like one over square root the length of the sequence, and so that's what I'm gonna shoot for here as well. And so our goal here is that for each of these subsequences, defined again by one of the demographic groups that I care about and, and, and one of the thresholds I might have used, that um, our empirical deviation from 95% coverage should go to zero at a rate of one over square root of the uh, you know, length of the subsequence. Even in the ideal case when everything was drawn from a distribution that I knew, this is the best I could hope for. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the upper T's should be tau's, apologies. Yes? 
So if I understand correctly, 95% is your exact target. Getting 96% would be, is a, incurs a penalty. Yeah, I don't want 96. Like, if I only wanted 95% or more, there'd be like a trivial and not useful solution, which is to always include the entire label set as my prediction set. Then I cover the label 100% of the time. I don't want to do that either. I want to cover it 95% of the time so that for a model that is you know, highly certain about its predictions, I can give very small prediction sets, right? If there's, if there's a single label that, cut, you know, that shows up, you know, 100% of the time, I want my prediction set to just have that label. So I don't want 94%, I don't want 96%. Okay. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to bound, you know, like the maximum over all of these groups and all of these thresholds of you know, my empirical deviation um, from, from 95% you know, divided by uh, you know, the deviation that I'm willing to tolerate, square root the length of the sequence, I'd like to bound you know, all of these quantities by something small, like one. Now this is kind of an annoying thing to think about. It, it depends on the whole history, the whole interaction with the adversary. And you know, like at some point, you know, if I've if I've made some decisions, you know, what's done is done. What an easier thing to think about, um, and more relevant to what the algorithm should do at some particular round, is sort of to ask, well, you know, what should I do at round t that will minimize the increase in this multi-validity loss? Right? What, what can I do to minimize the increase? And so our goal is to somehow argue that the learner always has some way of picking a threshold that guarantees that, and it might be a randomized way, it guarantees that sort of the expected increase of this, of this sort of multi-validity penalty term as a result of the decision I make at round t, so the increase from round t minus 1 to t, is small. Here the expectation is over the randomness that the learner might use. And of course, if I can promise that the learner can always choose some prediction to make that guarantees that the expected increase in loss is small, then of course, um, you know, I can add up these expected increases over time and conclude that, that the loss at the end is small. And that's what I want to do. Okay, interlude, zero-sum games. So uh, let me remind you what a zero-sum game is. All right? If you've ever played rock, paper, scissors, you play a zero-sum game. So, so a zero-sum game has two players, right? a, a minimization player and a maximization player. And they each have some set of actions they can play, you know, rock, paper, and scissors, for example. And there's some like utility function, some objective function, that the minimization player would like to make small and the maximization player would like to make large. So their interests are diametrically opposed. Right? Like maybe in rock, paper, scissors, the utility function is one if I win and it's zero if you win. So I'm the maximization player and you're the minimization player. Um, okay, and uh, right, so, so if, if I give you a set of strategies for the minimization player, a set of strategies for the maximization player, and a utility function that one of them would like to minimize and the other one would like to maximize, I've given you a specification for a zero-sum game. And um, by the way, like when I'm using this, I'm always going to identify the minimization player with the learner and the maximization player with the adversary. Now, the one thing to know about zero-sum games is von Neumann's min-max theorem. And what it says is that the order of play doesn't matter, at least if you're allowed to use randomization. Okay? So we play rock, paper, scissors typically simultaneously. But if I'm allowed to use randomized strategies, it doesn't matter, if, at least if I'm playing well, if I have to announce my strategy to you ahead of time and let you best respond. Right? I, can, I can say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to randomize between rock and paper and scissors uniformly. And like, telling you that doesn't allow you to do any better. Right? So the min-max theorem says if I want to know how well players can do in a game if they're playing optimally, it doesn't matter if the minimization player is forced to announce their strategy and the maximization player gets to best respond, or if it's reversed, if the maximization player is forced to announce their strategy and then the minimization player gets to best respond. Right? Like, I can analyze the game in either way and I'll get the same answer. 
Now that's useful for us because we can think when we're playing against an adversary as playing a zero sum game. I'll specify which one in a moment. But the way we're actually playing it is we, the learner, the minimization player, are forced to announce our strategy to the adversary. Because our strategy is defined by the algorithm we're using. Right? So you know, the algorithm we're using you know, is enough information for the adversary to figure out exactly what distribution of predictions we're going to make at the next round. And if we really want to work against every adversary, we need to be willing to let the adversary best respond. OK, that's hard. But the Minimax theorem says if we can set things up as a zero sum game, then we can analyze what's going on by imagining that the adversary gets to go first and tells us the label distribution before we need to make the prediction. And of course, prediction is much easier if you already know the thing you're predicting. So that's what's going to happen. OK, so here's the idea. We're going to define a zero sum game between the learner and the adversary. What's the strategy space for the learner? It's the set of thresholds that the learner gets to use. We'll have to discretize it, but we can discretize it as finely as we like. What's the strategy space for the adversary? Well, it's the set of label distributions they can pick. But we only care about the label insofar as it affects the conformity score. So we can think about it in a reduced form way. The adversary gets to pick a conformity score for the label or a distribution over conformity scores. And the thing that the learner would like to minimize and the adversary would like to maximize is this term we wrote down, which is the increase in our multi-validity loss at this round. We would like to be able to play so as to guarantee that this increase in loss is kept small. Okay. Now, as I said, the learner has to go first, which is difficult, right? We need to write down an algorithm and, you know, like it's got to work against an adversary who thinks about our algorithm and tries to give us the hardest sequence of examples. But because this is a zero sum game, we can analyze how well the best learner could do by imagining that the adversary goes first. Now what happens if the adversary goes first? That means every day before we have to make our prediction, they tell us their label distribution. They tell us the distribution on conformity scores. Well, in this case, it's clear we can do well. It's clear we can have small multi-validity loss because this puts us in the position of the oracular weather forecaster. Right, like we know ahead of time what this distribution on conformity scores is. We have the luxury of just like reading off from the CDF, like you know, like the 95th percentile of it, and that's our threshold. Okay, so, so in this hypothetical world in which the adversary goes first, prediction is very easy. And the Minimax theorem tells us that you know, there is some algorithm that does as well as you could do in this hypothetical world in which the adversary announced to you ahead of time the label distribution. We can apply the Minimax theorem to conclude that the learner can do just as well against a worst case adversary. Now, of course, this is a non-constructive argument. It doesn't give us the algorithm, but we'll get there. OK, so, so there's you know, some calculations you need to do. But let me tell you the theorem that results when you, get the when you do the calculations. It says, there is an algorithm. We don't know what it is yet, because this was a non-constructive invocation of the Minimax theorem that can be parametrized by an arbitrary collection of groups, G, and it can take as input an arbitrary sequence of models for your prediction problem and an arbitrary sequence of conformity score functions that can be different every day. They can depend on the past, so they can be based on training on past data you've seen, such that against any sequence of examples that could be even chosen adaptively by an adversary, that with high probability, with probability 1 minus delta, not only do I cover close to 95% of the labels, but even when I zoom in on the subsequence of examples that corresponded to any of the demographic groups S in the set that my algorithm was told you cared about, and um, thresholds that define my calibration guarantee, even when I zoom in on that subset, I cover close to 95% of the labels. How close? Well, on the order of, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I cover like 95% of them plus or minus something on the order of uh, 1 over square root the length of that sequence, which is the statistically optimal rate, like even if I was predicting according to a known distribution for empirical coverage, except there is no distribution here. This is against sort of an adversarial sequence. Okay. <clears throat> 
So, so this minimax argument with some details I've left out, you know, gives you the existence of such an algorithm. Okay, how do you get the algorithm? Well, in some sense, like deriving the algorithm at this point, you know, like there's some work to do, but but it's clear what you need to do. Right, the, what the algorithm should be doing is it should be predicting according to the Nash equilibrium distribution defined by the game that we analyzed at each round. Okay, so you have to figure out what that is. But you can do that, and in this case, there's a pretty simple elementary closed form solution for what the algorithm should do. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't want you to focus too much on the details, but I want you to notice at a high level what's going on and, and that it is simple and computationally lightweight. Every day, a patient walks in, you get a new feature vector, and you look, you know, what groups is this patient a member of? And for each threshold, you compute a number that is a sum of a bunch of numbers, one for each group that the patient is a member of. And for each group, that number you compute has something to do with the empirical coverage error you have on that group so far. Okay. And then, except for a couple of special cases, what you do is you look for two adjacent thresholds such that your coverage error, as weighted in this funny way, has opposite sign. And you randomize between those two thresholds. So this is an almost deterministic algorithm in that every day, it is using randomization, but every day it's announcing a threshold that is just randomizing between tau and tau plus epsilon for some tau and for epsilon as small as you like. Okay. So in the last few minutes, I want to show you some sort of you know, preliminary experimental results that, that convince you that like there really is an algorithm here. It's, it's not all you know, invocations of the minimax theorem. All right. Um, and, and these are, these are um, preliminary results that, that uh, the other people on the title slide hastily put together for me, you know, like last night so that I could give a talk. So, you know, interpret them with that in mind. Okay. So let's start with something really simple. And sort of the point I want to make here is that this robust method that has all of these nice properties, it covers conditional on group, it offers, it doesn't require distributional assumptions. You know, it's, it's competitive with split conformal prediction, even in idealized settings when everything comes from a distribution. Okay, so here's an idealized setting. Just a synthetic linear regression problem. Every day we're going to generate random features, IID from some distribution. The label comes from some unknown linear model, but it really is a linear function of the features plus some Gaussian noise. So everything's IID. It's the simplest prediction problem you could imagine. The only catch is that, like, you don't know what this linear model is. So you simultaneously have to solve the learning problem as you go and calibrate your prediction sets. And so split conformal prediction, because it sort of requires that the distribution on conformity scores in your calibration set be exactly the same as the, as the distribution on conformity scores that you're seeing, it requires that you split the data into two parts. One part for training your model and the other part for, for uh, calibrating it. Uh, and, and it really does require this. It's not just a technicality. If you, if you don't do this, it fails spectacularly. The advantage that our method has here is that since we didn't require, oh, and, and the reason it requires this is because, you know, when you train a model on data, it'll, it'll mildly overfit that data. And so the distribution on conformity scores for the data you trained on does not look like the distribution on conformity scores for data you haven't seen yet. Now, our method doesn't require any kind of exchangeability assumption. So while we're training the model, we can use all of the data. We don't have to worry about maintaining exchangeability of the conformity scores. Okay, so, so that's why our model, even though it's not taking advantage of the statistical regularities that are present in this problem, might have an advantage. And indeed, this is a, just a, oops, this is just a plot for empirical coverage over time, and both of the methods approach 80%, which is the target. Um, you know, at the end of 1,000 rounds, um, you know, the coverage of both methods is you know, slight, you know, pretty similar, like, like we actually have slightly higher coverage than the split conformal prediction method, but our interval widths are narrower. Right, so that's what you want. You want narrow widths, uh, narrow intervals with the right coverage. 
Okay, and the reason is because we get to train the model on more data, because we we're not beholden to this exchangeability assumption. Okay, how about group-wise coverage? So again, synthetic linear regression problem, data is IID, but now I'm gonna devote the first 10 features of the data to, to be sort of bin independent binary indicators of group. Okay, so you could imagine that the first one is binary gender. The second one, you know, is some racial designation. The third one has to do with nationality. The fourth one is disability. The fifth one has to do with sexuality. Okay, so, so someone can be a member of many of these groups. In fact, you know, if for each of these 10 features, there's a group corresponding to when the feature is one, and there's another group corresponding to when the feature is zero, everyone's a member of exactly 10 of these groups. Now, um, unbeknownst to the algorithm, you know, it turns out if your first feature is, uh, if your first feature is zero, then there's gonna be high noise on your label, and if your first feature is one, there'll be low noise on your label. That's the only, it turns out, the only thing that's relevant about these groups. Now, when you run, run split conformal prediction in the standard way that doesn't know about the groups, then you sort of, what happens is what you'd expect, which is that on the group with low noise, you overcover, and on the group with high noise, you undercover. And in particular, yeah, okay, so, so that's like the bad thing that happens with, with regular split conformal prediction. And there's a, a conservative thing you can do with split conformal prediction when you have you know, 10 intersecting groups. You can separately calibrate for each of the 10 groups. And what do you do when you encounter someone who's a member of you know, a bunch of them? You take the most conservative threshold of all of them. And you can do that here, and it predictably overcovers. Whereas our method um, gets sort of much closer to the, the target coverage within each group, and in particular gets uh, in the low noise group correctly a much narrower um, a much narrower prediction interval, and on the high noise group a much wider prediction interval, correctly identifying the additional uh, uncertainty on that group. Okay, how about unanticipated distribution shift? So here, this is an experiment on real data. It's, it's census-derived income data. Um, okay, so the prediction, it's again, a regression problem. The prediction task is from census data to predict income. And here, we're gonna think about unanticipated distribution shift. So for split conformal prediction, it'll be trained, you know, it'll be calibrated on data from California. But what's gonna happen is when the algorithm's running, initially the data points will come from California, but then they'll start coming from Pennsylvania. It's a little bit different. Okay, so the conformal prediction method, uh, the target coverage is 80%. The conformal prediction method doesn't get the right coverage. It overcovers. Ours gets the right coverage. And in exchange for that, we get narrower prediction intervals. Again, sort of more correctly identifying the, the uncertainty of these predictions, despite the distribution shift. And finally, time series data. So this is predicting... Um, daily volatility of, of a stock, AMD, from 2000 to 2020. So, so 20 years of data. Um, okay, so you know, stocks have prices. Um, the returns of a stock are like the relative increase or decrease in those prices on a day, and the volatility is the square of the return. So big volatility means big uh, relative change in price, either in a positive direction or a negative direction. And we took, uh, you know, we took some off-the-shelf model called Garch for predicting uh, volatility, which I don't know much about. I'm just interested in, in uh, you know, quantifying the uncertainty of this model. Okay. Um, this is very much not IID data, right? Like you can, you can see 20 years of financial events in this data. Um, and indeed, our prediction interval with sort of track those, and we get the correct you know, the target 90% coverage very closely, 89.8%. Uh, okay, finally, fully adversarial ordering. Like, suppose we wanted to, like, truly break split conformal prediction. What would we do? We would sort the data by the conformity score, and we would feed it to the method in increasing order of conformity score. Because then, like, every point you see is further away from the target than anything you've ever seen before. Okay, so split conformal prediction gets 0% coverage here, but we get very close to the correct coverage. Okay, so with that, as the timer ticks down to zero, let me say thank you uh, 
I hope you enjoyed the talk. There's a, a paper with, with some of the theory with like the min-max argument, but not the actual practical algorithm that's already out and that you can read. And, and the, the, the work that this talk is mostly about, the practical algorithm and, and the somewhat better bounds, I, I hope that that'll be online uh, soon. And so thanks for having me. <laughs>